sound. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. I hope this uh, the sound got fixed. Uh, so I'll run through what I already talked about. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mandy. So I'll give it a moment to clear so I can uh, update and restart now that I have sound. This is why I love the interaction. I would have done a whole half hour talking with no sound. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Today's topic is almonds are making bees nuts. And um, if you're an experienced beekeeper, I'm sure you can already tell where I'm going with this. Uh, do I have any sound yet? I'd like to get all oh, good. Thank you, Mandy. Also, thank you for your card. I got it the other day. Um, all right. So if you are uh, watching this video, I'd like you to comment in the in the comments. Like I just had some commenters. Uh, tell me if you're watching live or if you're going to watch the replay. And I'd also like to know where you're from because, um, oh, thank you, Rob because I love hosting this show. It gives me the opportunity to talk to beekeepers all over the country. And uh, I like to get all these different experiences and uh, hear from other people's methods, hear their approaches. Um, and I like this to all be a, a nice communication and a back and forth. Um, so I'd love your comments. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments and I'll loop back to them. Uh, the, my favorite commenter gets one of these really cool Beak Talk stickers. Um, yes, yeah, so that's my favorite commenter. Or if you would like to purchase any of these stickers, they're on my website and I dropped them in the comments. Uh, so you can check it out there. Oh, hi, Joy. Joy is uh, one of my neighbors out here. Um, all right. So before I get started with today's topic, I skipped last week's episode for Christmas and I got a really cool beekeeping tool that I'd like to share with you guys. Um, so I really want to do this before I, I even get into today's topic. But first, I'd like to pop up a little video so you can see what I got. This is a video that I took with this endoscope. I'm trying to find out where my camera is. It is a long snake with a little camera on the end. And it is just narrow enough to fit in the hive. It is a little under three eighths of an inch. So it fits within our B space, which is three eighths. Um, for those of you who are new, three eighths of an inch is basically the hallways inside of the hive. The distance between the frames is three eighths of an inch, just big enough for a B. And this endoscope is um, 11 30 seconds of an inch. So it's just thin enough to fit in between the combs uh, and get me some really cool content like this video I have here. Uh, this is uh, just inside the upper entrance of my hive. So you can see the screening above where I have my cedar shavings and the sugar that they're crawling and eating on. Um, so I really am really impressed with this product. I'm trying to find out where my frame is. If you would like to pick up one of these, they're only 35 bucks on Amazon. Uh, I think it's worth it for, for, for beekeepers alone. But if you're someone who does some construction and you just want to see things from a different perspective, the endoscope is really cool. Um, and you can also stick this in the hive to see if your bees are still doing well, if they're still alive. And uh, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm really excited that I get to play with this. So hopefully we'll have some more cool content from the endoscope coming out soon. Um, if you'd like to pick this up, I have a link for it in my suggested products page on BlossomBuzzBees.buzz. Uh, I have a link for the website in the comments. Um, okay, let's get started. This episode is called uh, Almonds Are Making Bees Go Nuts. I'm sure some of the experienced and more red beekeepers know where I'm going to go with this topic. Uh, it's a little bit of a clickbaity topic, uh, title I should say, but um, whew, I, think it's, I think it's really cool. I think it's important that we have a discussion about where our food comes from and how it's produced and all of the uh, stakeholders along the way. Uh, so let's get into it. Here, it, I should mention, this is a very, very broad topic that I am 
just setting the basic skeleton today. And I'm hoping in future Beak Talks, I'll get more nitty gritty on each of the really broad topics that I'm gonna to cover today. Um, but let's start with the basics. This is, this is the rundown. Each year in February, millions of beehives from all over the United States get trucked to the Central Valley of California to pollinate the almonds. Uh, you might have heard that almonds affect honeybees, but not many people know why. This episode is, is all about that. Um, I see I have some comments. I'll get back to you guys at the end. Um, so the almonds, the almond pollination is a big, big business. Uh, since it's such a big topic, like I said, I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to ask questions and then answer my own questions. That way, I think it will uh, compartmentalize the information and make it a little bit more digestible for you at home. Uh, so if you have any questions on what I'm talking about, drop them in the comments and I'll loop back to them. First question I'm gonna ask, why can't the bees that are already living in California just pollinate the almonds on their own? Uh, this is the obvious question that people ask. They say, why do we have to move bees if there's already bees in California? Um, this has to do with our commercial, like industrial farming practices. Um, the, the one I'm talking most specifically is called monocultures or monocropping. Um, it's done all over the world, but we're pretty bad with how we do it here in America. Um, think of a monocrop as one single species of a plant or a tree in the in, like a whole area. Um, so if you are a, a person who keeps a really nice lawn at home and it's all lush and green and cut, you know, just to size, or like think of a, a think of a golf course where there's no weeds, no nothing, just grass, that is a monocrop or a monoculture. It just so happens that grass, you know, a regular lawn is the most, um, sucks up the most water. It is the most irrigated crop that we grow in America. So all of the corn and soy and all that uh, doesn't suck up as much water as we water our lawns with every year. Um, Lawns are a whole separate discussion I can break into at another time. Uh, today we're talking about almonds. Um, what they do in the Central Valley of California, it's the right climate to grow almonds. They grow on trees. Uh, so these farmers, they, they plant almonds and that's all they grow. Uh, since they want the most nutrients to go to their trees to produce more almonds, they don't grow any grasses or let any weeds grow on the ground. So there's thousands of acres uh, of almond trees for these farms, for these orchards, with no other crops, just almonds. Uh, it's efficient for growing, uh, but it's not the best for the ecosystem. How things usually work, there's, there's an environment and there's usually thousands of different species of trees and plants and microorganisms and grubs and bugs and all that stuff. And they're all kind of intermingled with each other. And how this works is any time of year, there's someone supplying something for someone. Uh, so in the springtime, there's plants that are soaking up nutrients from the soil and they bloom and then the bees can take those blooms or if it's the winter time, there's leaves that are decomposing, uh, decomposing and contributing to the soil. And it's a whole, whole cycle and that's natural, but we don't farm that way. It's not efficient to farm that way. Um, at least the way we do it in America. Uh, so they grow a lot of one thing and they grow a lot of only that. And that's how we do almonds. Um, so since we do this practice of a million acres of almonds in California, um, who produce almost all the almonds we consume around the world, um, those almonds only bloom for about one month, mid-February to mid-March, and that's about it. 
Um, so why can't the bees who naturally live in California pollinate the almonds? Um, it's because they wouldn't survive the rest of the year. They would have a heck of a lot of food, a lot of work to do for one month, and then a desert, dry, barren desert land for the rest of the year. Uh, so they'd have to stock up a lot of honey to survive that time. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't like to live on only almonds alone. Uh, there's not enough nutrients. There's not enough um, micronutrients to keep things going. Um, so if you only ate Big Macs for a whole month, you'd probably be in some trouble. Same thing with the bees. Um, so, yeah, that's why beekeepers are paid to move hives temporarily to California to pollinate the almonds. Uh, if you have any questions about what I just said, please drop them in the comments. I'm going to move along to my next question here, which is how big is the almond pollination? Uh, I told you it's big. I told you it's a big business. Uh, but as far as colonies and dollars go, each one acre of almond trees needs about two beehives to effectively pollinate it. Um, with over a million acres of al almonds planted in California, that's two million hives that need to be brought in each year. This represents well over 50% of the managed beehives in the U.S. And uh, each one of those hives can charge about $170 per month um, to be there pollinating. Uh, of course, that dollar value goes up with the stronger the hive. Um, and there's, there's a whole big system into making sure hives are exactly what they're specified in the contracts. Um, but yes, the California almond pollination is so big and valuable that it represents about one third of the entire beekeeping industry. So all of you buying boxes and frames and bees from people is only two thirds of the industry. The other third is pollinating almonds. Big business, big business. Uh, I am really interested in this topic. I'm having a hard time keeping it all concise for this episode. Um, but when I tell you it, I'm giving you the basic bare bones, that's really what I'm doing. Um, while I was doing my research, I reached out to an industry expert, and uh, I'm really excited to announce I have her as a guest speaker for the last Beak Talk of January. Uh, so uh, later in, in 2021, in the end of January, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Brittany Goodrich, who is an agricultural economist uh, who specifically studies the almond industry. She's going to come on and answer a few questions that we have. Uh, so please subscribe to my page and like it uh, so you don't miss out. And also, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Goodrich, uh, drop them in the comments with the hashtag AskTheExpert. Um, I'm hoping in 2021 to have a lot of cool guests come on, and uh, I, think, I think Dr. Goodrich will be a really valuable friend of the show. All right, that was a little aside. Next question where do these bees come from and where do they go? Um, we are going to talk about the migratory patterns of beekeeping, um, what beekeepers participate in pollination rentals, and the honeybee supply chain a little bit as I answer this question. Um, if you're a beekeeper who participates in any part of this industry uh, about the almonds and the, the migration and stuff, Please comment and let me know where you're from and a little bit about what you do, because I'd love to I'd love to have a bit of an interaction in the comments. Um, so, really, operations of any size can can rent for pollination. Last, I, I should say, this year, this spring, I rented two hives in April uh, for a local orchard who just wanted to to beef up their pollination to uh, try and increase their yield for this year. Like I said, any size beekeeper can do it, and you already might be doing it. Pollination is often done through strategic partnerships. So for example, if you're an expanding beekeeper and meet a farmer who grows many crops, the, the farmer can benefit from having bees on their land. You can benefit from having an extra piece of land to establish an additional apiary, or that farmer might already have some infrastructure that you need. They might already have 
um, a little patch that you could put bees that is already covered with an electric fence. Um, they might have uh, a kitchen that you can spin honey and sell it from. So there's some strategic partnerships that you can build up. Um, and some of you might already be doing that. Uh, and that's a very basic pollination contract. Um, however, it is on a much, much, much bigger scale for almonds. The average beekeeper who participates in the almond run uh, has about 4,000 colonies. These large operations move their bees by the semi-truck load. Bee trucks, we're talking about bee trucks, folks, of about 400 to 500 colonies per truck. And they're all stacked on pallets and moved around like any other product. Uh, however, instead of being dumped in one of those covered trailers, uh, they're stacked on a flatbed like, like lumber and stuff. And uh, instead of having that covered tra uh, trailer, they do a net to keep the bees from flying away, but also to protect bystanders in case that truck rolls over in an accident. Uh, you might have seen a video on the news of uh, a toppled truck carrying beehives cause, causes trouble on the interstate. Um, it happens more often than you think. Uh, so I get to play around with my green screen, uh, green screen today. So let me pop this up. Since we're talking about migration patterns, I have a U.S. map, and I get to feel like a meteorologist today. Um, okay. Woo. So these commercial operators are located all over the continental U.S., but they mostly come from California and you know, the Pacific Northwest area. A lot of them are in Texas. A lot of them are in Florida. Um, the most, there are, um, there are more almond trees that are being planted. So the more almonds that are planted, there's more of a demand for bees. Uh, with that increased demand for bees, uh, of course, the price goes up per hive. Uh, with the value of hives going up, it is more cost effective to ship bees from farther away from California. So although it's very easy for California beekeepers to pollinate the almonds, um, because there's such a demand, it's actually becoming more cost effective to truck bees from Pennsylvania or Maine or uh, New York, Georgia, all the way across the country to California to do their work. They want a little slice of the pie. Um, so this talks about where they come from. Now I want to talk about where do these bees go? At the end of the almond pollination, also nicknamed the Super Bowl of bees, uh, the hives are stacked back up onto our bee trucks and um, they're moved all around the country to pollinate more crops. You know, monocropping is not just an almond issue. It's, it's an issue we have in our farming practices all over the country. Um, almonds bloom in February, and then these bee trucks are moved up from California. They're moved up through the Pacific Northwest, pollinating grapes and apples and other fruit trees and nut trees and crops like that. And then uh, I should also mention some of these growers move to Florida to do the oranges, the citrus groves, things like that. Um, so once once almonds is over, everyone kind of scatters back to where they came from. Um, some of these hives, some of these operations are moving all over the place and they don't necessarily have a home location. However, most of the time, these operations end up in like Mayish or so. They end up around the Dakotas um, in this kind of area because land is a little cheap. Uh, the soil is is all right, but you can plant clover, which is really inexpensive, and you can get your clover honey, or you could also do pollination for canola or sunflower and those kinds of oils. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to share this information. Um, I think it's really important. Not a lot of people, people know uh, what happens to our food, where it comes from, and all the stakeholders that are involved. Um, People here, you know, don't drink cow's milk because it's cruel and uh, bad for the environment. And there's people who say, instead of drinking cow, drink oat milk or almond milk, sorry, uh, because it's better than 
cows. Well, that might be the case, but it's a lot worse for bees. Um, so it's all kind of just trying to figure out something that works for everyone. Um, anyway, this is, like I said, this is a, a really complex issue that I'm, I'm just touching on. But um, so once these operations leave California, un unless they're already based out there, they have surplus bees. It was a big growing season. Many of these operations sell bees to each other. People are trying to retire, so they sell bees to people who are growing. Um, a lot of it is inter interoperation selling. Um, but a large portion of the growers also take those colonies from California uh, end of mid you know mid March, bring them back to wherever they came from and divide them into nucleus colonies or packages that are sold to you, the hobbyist beekeeper, you and me. Um, so this is this kind of shows you the whole supply chain. Um, colonies are small, they grow a little bit, they go to the almonds, they grow bigger in the almonds, then they come back, they're broken down, they're distributed. Um, so if you're in the Northeast, like I'm based here in Pennsylvania, uh, if you wanna let me know where you're from, uh, in the comments, that'd be great. I'm here in Pennsylvania, and it is pretty normal for people to order packages from the South. Um, they do this because, you know, it being a little bit warm in the South, by the time April comes around for our the, the start of our honey flow, we can have mated queens already installed and ready to start flying and connecting, collecting nectar. If you're getting packages from, let's say, Georgia or Florida or, you know, brought up from Texas even, chances are those colonies were in California for the almonds. Um, and it's all different. That's why it's important to check in and see where your, your bees come from. Uh, and that's actually going to be the heart of my topic for next week's Beak Talk, where we're going to be talking about queens, um, a little bit about genetics and stocks, and where you should get your bees. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about this, the whole big picture supply chain. Like I said, it is a big, it is a big topic and I'm definitely going to break it down in, in future big talks. Um, as you can see, this is, this is kind of risky. We're moving 80% of the managed beehives in the whole country to one little tiny I'm talking this big, the middle part of middle part of California, 80% of the hives squished into one spot for just, you know, just for three weeks. Uh, it's a little risky. There's, there's the, the risk of diseases being spread all across the country in a matter of weeks. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into preventing that. Um, there are many honeybee inspectors who work to stop the spread of mites, EFB, AFB, other diseases, and invasives. Um, like so, for example, here in Pennsylvania, we have an invasive species of leafhopper called the spotted lanternfly. Uh, if you're in the Northeast, you're probably hearing about the spotted lanternfly. I'll do a whole big talk about that too. But um, we have to get special licenses to make sure we're not spreading those invasives. Uh, same thing for bees uh, and, and beekeepers. The hives are checked before they depart the state they're leaving from. Then they're checked when, they're, when they arrive in California. Then there's another inspector who's a third party between the grower and the beekeeper who checks to make sure the hives meet the standards that they set out in their contracts. And again, to make sure there's no diseases or high mite loads um, or anything funky going on. Um, they also tabulate the hives because the grower is not going to go out and, and, and make sure there really is 5,000 hives from this person and 9,000 from that person and whatsoever. Um, but then at the end of, uh, you know, mid-March, at the end of the bloom, it all kind of happens in reverse again. Uh, a California inspector makes sure they're disease free before they're sent back across the country. And then when those operators park their trucks, their wherever my bee truck, bee trucks, um, 
they're inspected again in the state. So if you're in Pennsylvania and want to move bees to New York, you got to get inspected a couple times to make that happen. Um, so although it's a pain when you're doing it, it's definitely beneficial for the industry. Um, but it's still risky. They don't inspect every hive. They inspect an average of those hives. Uh, so there's still, still risk. Um, if you've ever purchased bees from out of state, you should have received a copy of an inspection sheet that confirms that they're healthy and that they're disease free. Um, and it'll probably also tell you a little bit about the origin of the hive uh, or the, the seller, the breeder. Um, so I, as a bee breeder, have to get inspected and they give me a sheet and I send copies whenever I sell queens and stuff. Um, a lot of people don't really care about it. I wish I brought one of those papers in with me so I could show you, but it, you know, it looks like a, a standard government contract kind of thing. Um, let's take some questions that we have. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you. Um, even if you're watching on a replay, I can go in and, and comment to answer your questions. If you have anything about um, this topic, the almond industry, uh, the, the risk factors that, that bleed from the almond pollination through the rest of the beekeeping industry, um, anything that you want to learn more about, drop them in the comments so I can maybe do a future beak talk about it. Um, let's see. Let's see what we got. Uh, um, also, you can follow the links that I dropped in the comments to my website where you can you can get some of these cool stickers or see some of my suggested products like the really cool endoscope that I started the, uh, the beak talk out with. Um, so you can definitely check out some more information there. But let me read through a few of these, few of these comments here. Uh, Amanda says that she loves I'm sharing the info. Well, thanks, Amanda. Uh, she just ordered four nukes starting our hives in spring, and she's from Texas. Well, good luck. Uh, Texas beekeeping should be fun. Uh, the weather allows you to check hives a lot more often than I can do here in the Northeast. Um, so I get a bit more value out of the endoscope than you might um, because, man, I miss my bees. <laughs> I'm glad that you're starting out with uh, more, than, more than one or two hives because you get that perspective. You know, if you have four nukes, you get to see who's successful, who's not right off the bat. Um, folks who only start out with one hive don't get that perspective. Uh, so good luck to you. Who else do we have? We have Rob. He is in South Dakota. Ho! On my map. Uh, two years in, hobby status. It'll take a while. I hope, uh, I say I hope you don't get bit by the bug like I did, but I don't know. Um, we see lots and lots of hives being transported up and down I-29. Yeah, I can imagine that. I visit um, California. My my brother lives in NorCal, and um, you know I go fishing with him, and we drive all over the state. And I'm always freaking out because I'm like, ah, bees! Uh, but we're usually driving too fast for me to take my own pictures of them. Uh, so that's why I don't have any cool bee truck pictures to show off. Um, but yeah, you you know you don't you don't think about it. But now that I told you. Keep your eyes peeled for bee trucks because you'll probably see a few. Uh, maybe not now, but certainly in the summer. Uh, Amanda asks, she says, I'm new to beekeeping. When installing new hives, which way should the hives face? Um, so this is, this is one of those topics where people always have differing opinions. And it is incredibly dependent on the landscape of your area. Um, my recommendation is to have morning sun on your bees. If your the entrance of your hive can be blessed with some morning sun just as it cracks over the tree lines or over the um, the horizon, that will be bees. Um, so what do they say? Uh, rises in the west, sets in the east, or something like that. Um, so you you you'd like to make sure that the hives get early sun. If they can be protected from really hot, uh, like noon or late afternoon sun, if, there can, if they can be shaded during that time, that's also really beneficial. 
Um, but the morning sun is really crucial. Um, the way my apiary is set up, I don't, it's up against the forest, like the woods. And by the time the sun hits the hive, it's 11 o'clock. So I say I have teenage bees because they don't get out of bed till 11. And um, where we are, we don't really get direct hot sun. Uh, so I don't really have to worry about them getting too hot. But uh, if, you're, if your apiary is set up on like a asphalt pad or like dark gravel or something where it can really build heat, that afternoon sun, that afternoon shade would be really beneficial. Um, so what I'd recommend is choose, write it on your calendar every couple of weeks uh, from now until you establish your bees. Um, pick, pick your general location for the apiary. Um, of course, I don't know what your property is like and what capabilities you have to control the property. Um, but sit out in the morning, seven o'clock, sit in a chair, uh, drink your coffee outside and uh, just see where the sun comes up and, and where you think some nice, uh, the direction, you know, people say, oh, it should be set, it should be set north just to make sure you can always get the sun. That's not always the case. Sometimes flip backwards is good. Um, I have apiaries where the entrances are facing all four directions and the hives do well. Um, I think I think the the morning sun is the most important. That's what wakes them up. Um, so keep that in mind. It is it is really dependent on your location and and your situation. Um, I wish I could offer you a bit more advice, uh, other than to just go sit out and do some observing. But I think that is a skill that is good for beekeeping. Uh, the ability to just sit and observe. Um, if you haven't learned that skill yet, I think beekeeping will teach you. Um, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a person, I'm not very patient, so I pick up hobbies like beekeeping or, or bonsai to force me to learn patience. And um, I think it's, it's pretty therapeutic. So I hope you can find some success with that and um, get your girls some early morning sun if possible. Oh, I was also going to say, um, if you have the option to cut a little niche into the woods. Um, I don't know what your predator situation might be. If you have to worry about bears, that might not be the best case. But if you can carve out a chunk of the woods for your apiary and keep some of that upper cover, um, but expose the entrances to the sun, that might be nice. You get some wind protection, which is good for the winter. Uh, I don't think Texas has as cold winters as we do in Pennsylvania. But you know, there's always options. And you can also uh, look up some Google images to see what other people have done. Um, yeah, I would just be cautious as well while establishing the location for your apiary. Uh, you want to make sure that you can cut the grass easily. So if you're putting up hive stands, uh, either put them close enough where you don't need to cut the grass inside or make them wide enough where you can put the mower in between. Um, and also, a lot of people like to put their hives in their garden, which is good. Uh, but if you're an avid gardener, uh, July, the bees can sometimes get nasty. So unless you are totally cool with beekeeping with a, a net on, uh, maybe put them at the far corner of the, of the garden. Um, but exactly, that sun is important. Uh, let me read some more questions, if I have any. Uh, I, I'd like to... To thank everyone again who reminded me in the beginning that I didn't have any sound. Uh, I'm, I was trying a few more aspects of this program that I use called StreamYard uh, to do these live streams. And I guess I messed around with some, <laughs> some buttons I should be messing with. Um, hello again to Joy and Alyssa um, and Mandy. She looked up on Amazon uh, last night. Oh! She wants an endoscope. Mandy, I recommend it. Um, it's fun. You can look up your nose or in your ear. I looked, uh, I got it Christmas morning and I immediately had to look under the fridge and all the weird places that you can't usually see. I just like getting the perspective of something I didn't get the perspective of before. Um, let me see if there's any more. 
I think that might be it, folks. I think that's it for comments. Um, so yeah, this is the last show of 2020. Uh, it's been a crazy year. I'm sure everyone's excited to get this year behind us. Um, I'm happy that I get to spend this time with you each week to talk about bees. Um, I think it's something fun. I think there's a good sense in, of community in people who have the similar hobbies and similar interests communicating with each other. Uh, this year really put a put a wrench in a lot of people's normal sense of community. And I think we have to adapt to do these things online. Uh, although it's not as rich as we all would like, uh, I think it's important to still do things with people that have interests in things we're interested in as well. Um, so I hope to have a lot of fun beep talks in 2021. I'm already scheduling out uh, my episodes and my topics. I'm already booking, um, already booking guest speakers and things. Like I said, Dr. Goodrich will be on the last episode of January on the 19th. I have my nephew Ben coming on because it's his birthday and we're going to be talking about kid-friendly beekeeping tasks and topics. Um, but next week, next Tuesday, we're talking about bee genetics and stocks and where you should be getting your bees from and things to look out for. Um, and I might have a guest speaker with that one too. So there should be good things coming in 2021 and I'll see you then. Thank you.